Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're starting a new series this week on the book of Deuteronomy, actually entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. I seem to remember that present truth is kind of an important idea in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, so let's see what we can learn. This lesson is entitled Preamble to Deuteronomy. It's lesson number one for October 2 of 2021. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come now to study one of your very important books from the Old Testament, one that's repeatedly quoted in the New Testament, the final words of Moses to the children of Israel just before they crossed the flooded Jordan River to attack the city of Jericho. May we learn what you want us to learn from this book is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy was written about 1405 B.C. That would be at the end of those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It was written by Moses while the children of Israel were camped on the edge of the Jordan Valley across from the Jericho. Moses was giving the children of Israel final instructions before entering the land of Palestine. The book consists of four discourses or sermons that Moses prepared for giving to the people. The book of Deuteronomy is the fifth and last book of the Pentateuch. Pente, of course, means five, and Tuk means book, so the five books. It's the last of the five books. It contains Moses' farewell addresses to Israel before entering the Promised Land. As such, this book is marked by a sense of urgency. I wish we knew the details of the exact timing. Moses was very busy probably writing this book and arranging things and everything, and right there on the plains of Moab, while he's doing that, the children of Israel are relaxing, getting involved with Midianite women and doing a fertility cult ceremony and thousands of them died as a result and Moses is writing this book right while that was going on. Was he um, oblivious to what was going on? I just wonder how, how he could be. Well, anyway, as such, this book was marked by a sense of urgency. Moses was about to die and leave his people. And I, you know, God had told him, and I just wonder how I would feel and how you would feel if you knew that you're finishing everything, you're going to travel a short distance, and then you're going to lay down and die. Um, it's an interesting idea. Therefore, the purpose of his last words was to remind them of the most important teachings of God. Thus, this book is an ex exposition of the Israelite faith, the textbook for the leaders of the people in order to keep them on the right track. There were certain themes that are suggested by our Bible study guide for uh, this before book. Before you do that, I have a question. Okay. So Moses learned, our hypothesis is that Moses learned to write while he was in Egypt, uh, Egypt in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the royal household, in, I'm sure. In kingship school. Yeah. Who else in the, of the children of Israel knew anything about writing? Did they? That's a good question. Joshua, la Joshua later wrote books. So, um, did Moses teach them as in that? He, he probably years? could have. I mean, he spent forty years working with Joshua. That's the only other one that we know of that that was able to write. Remember that this was a time when the alphabet had just been invented. We'll talk about this later, but. Uh, before that, they were using hieroglyphics and cuneiform, and that's kind of, you know, pictographic writing. You, you, know, you can get a pretty good idea what the person was thinking, but, you know, it's nothing like having it spelled out with an alphabet. So, um, Jim, you want to tell us a little bit of what the themes of this book are? The God of history. As Moses addressed his people, he reminds them of the past events of history in which God saved them from slavery and took them out of Egypt through the hardships of the desert. The God of love, because God is love, he reaches out to his people and fights for them. In response, God's people will learn to love their God. God's covenant, 
This reciprocal relationship between God and his people take the form of a contract, a covenant between God and Israel, God's people. Israel is the people of the covenant. By no means does this designation in any way suggest that they are superior to other peoples. This covenant, which was initiated with Abraham, implies Israel's holiness and their commitment through love to fear God and obey his commandments. From the Bible study guide. Page 13. Well, the history of our world, and, and, and it's hard for us, it's hard for me, so maybe I shouldn't speak for you, but I think probably this is true for all of us, to remember that the history of our world from the beginning may seem to have moved very slowly at first. Almost half of the history of our world happened before Moses was born. And how much do we know about that? Very little. Maybe it was more than half. We don't know exactly how far back their um, creation was. And it's Moses, well, the words of Moses, or, or it's, the words are attributed to Moses that yeah. we have. Yeah, and it's mostly recorded in the history, the only accurate history of what was going on back then is, was recorded by Moses in the book of Genesis. We, narr we know very little about that period of time. So what are the most important things we need to learn from how it all started? And of course, now we're gonna, look, we're gonna explore other parts of the Bible to see if we can get some ideas. So you said not much happened during that time. Well, there was creation, there was the fall, there was the, build, the flood, building of the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. um, Abraham. Okay. All, yeah, there, there was a lot that happened. Well, but remember, those, <laughs> those events you're talking about are scattered over 3,000 years. And they're all compressed into a few chapters. Yes. So I think it's maybe that we just don't know much about it. Well, that's what I tried to suggest. First of all, we need to remember, and this should be a background principle as we work our way through the book of Deuteronomy here, that 1 John 4, 8, clear over at the end of the Bible, tells us that God is love. These words may seem to be very simple, but the, the ideas are profound. What is implied by the idea that the essence of God is love? Are we really capable of understanding that? At least we must agree that it's very good news. Could it be true that the love of God permeates the entire universe except for our little world? Are we prepared to love God back? I mean, what if it said God is hate? I mean, what would that imply about the universe? Or God doesn't care? You know, think about it. Well, we have some verses that'll give us some clues. Carrie, you wanna? I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's from the American Bible Society, 1992. Uh, moving along, Mark 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so here we see. Sounded like you were repeating yourself. Probably. Is that the point? <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> Clearly, Mark in his gospel is quoting from Deuteronomy. To be genuine, love must be freely given. Without freedom, you can't have love. God cannot force love. And the moment he tries to do that, it is no longer love. But God is not only love himself, but also he chooses to give us the ability to love him, and he challenges us to love him back. The saddest story of our entire universe is that one of the covering cherubs, Lucifer by name, chose to rebel against God while living in God's very presence. Lucifer did not want to love, and he did not want the universe to be ruled by love. He wanted to be in charge, he wanted to be the boss, he wanted to be selfish. The war in heaven took place before this world was created. We know that, where was Lucifer when our world was created? Well, the now Satan, where was he? On this earth, apparently. Demanding a place in the Garden of Eden, wasn't he? So the war in heaven took place before this world was created and Lucifer, now Satan, was ready to attack Adam and Eve, and we're not gonna, we don't have time to review that story. We presume that it's familiar. 
but we do have something more that about what... That story is in Revelation, right? Yes, well, it's, it's in Revelation and it's in Genesis, yeah. as, as far as the, the t original temptations is there. Okay, Myra, you're going to tell us a little bit about what, an idea about Satan before he came to this earth? See what Isaiah says in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. King of Babylonia, bright and morning star, you have fallen from heaven. Let, in let me interrupt for just a second. You may wonder why we call him Lucifer back before he came to this earth. Lucifer is just the Latin for bright morning star. So it's King of Babylon, Lucifer, you have fallen from heaven. Go ahead. Um, in the past? In the past, you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb you were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on the mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. From I'm the gonna, Bible. Good, thank you. I'm gonna interrupt again just a second. You thought, you thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble? That's Elohim. Yeah, do you know what, do you know what the, the word is for the mountains, the, the, the mountain where the gods assemble? Megiddo? No, well, Har-mageddon. Har-mageddon, Har mm -hmm. Har yes, Har-mageddon, that's where Har-mageddon comes from. The mountain where the gods assemble. The mountain of the assembly is another way of saying it. Mount of assembly, yeah. Okay. Okay, then from Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17. Mortal man, he said, grieve for the fate that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection, how wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden and the, gar the garden of God and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian, and jasper, sapphires, emeralds, and garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. And I interrupt again here. Does God like jewelry? He Apparently likes least, his gems. At least Lucifer did, Satan did. Likes, likes beautiful things, didn't he? Yeah. And apparently I God see. did. Ordered things. Okay, we'll get, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get to see it one day. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. It's interesting. Um, you lived on my holy mountain and walked among sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. You were busy buying and selling, and this led you to, the violent, to violence and sin. So I forced you to leave my holy mountain, and the angel who guarded you drove you away from the sparkling gems. You were proud of being handsome, and your fame made you act like a fool. Because of this, I hurled you to the ground and left you as a warning to other kings. Okay. One more. Revelation 12, verse 7. Then the war then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. So we, we're seeing here that there's very close links with the first book, between the first books of the Bible and the last book of, Bible, of the Bible, who gives us, so this whole thing is all one big story from the beginning to the end. It's very interesting. I, I always love to read very carefully and try to understand these things. I've come across a couple of quotations from Ellen White, which I haven't put in here because I, we can't, well, I can't just keep stuffing more and more stuff in here. But two things. One, when Adam and Eve sinned, Satan and his angels, the first thing they wanted to do was try to figure out how to rush in and get to the tree of life. Ellen White actually says that. And another place, even after they were cast out of the garden, she says the antediluvians were constantly trying to figure out a way to get into the, because the, the, the Garden of Eden didn't go up to heaven until the flood. The antediluvians were constantly trying to figure out a way that they could get in there and get to the tree of life. So 
Interesting stuff. When God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them one simple prohibition. Gordon? Genesis 2, 16 and 17 from the Good News Bible. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. But as we all know, Adam and Eve disobeyed. You want to carry on there? Genesis 3, 1 through 7, also from Good News Bible. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? And let me interrupt there a second. You notice he changed it. He, he did a little bit of, see, over here in, in Genesis 2, it's, you must not eat the, I'm sorry, except the tree that, you see, you may eat the fruit of any tree, and you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden. And what does, De, what does Satan say? Did you really tell you not to eat from any tree in the garden? So he's saying, you can't eat any of these trees. Go ahead. Verse 2, we may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Of course, she didn't know what die meant, did she? Yeah. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. That is, Satan is saying God's a liar. Yes. But in, if, if, past, if past experience is any indicator, based upon the text we have available, Satan, or the adversary, the serpent, ne had never seen death. That's right. And so by past experience, tell them that you don't die. There is no death. So, well, but l let's back up a second. When God said, in the day you eat of it, you will die, you don't think he made any effort to try to explain that to them? Well, I'm saying by yeah. the text we have. Based on the text I, we have. I, I, it's not illogical that he yeah. wouldn't have explained it, yeah. at least from my point of view. Yeah. Uh, it just, the text. We, we have to assume that. You know, we haven't seen heaven, but we believe that it exists, and we have some descriptions of it. Yeah. Presumably, they had some description of death. But what I'm trying to say is, yeah, many no. times we say, oh, the serpent was lying to him. No, he said, you're not going to die, but he also, t uh, so which could be, you could say, it may or not, may, may not have been true. But when he says, you'll become like God or the gods, knowing good from evil, that was true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was not a lie. So the lie that Satan said is, that's not true. God, i.e., what lying. God is saying is yeah. not true. Right. So, continuing with verse 4 again, the snake replied, that's not true, you will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. You won't really be like God, but you will know what's good and what is bad. <laughs> the woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate it. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given understanding and realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. Wow. I, I can't imagine. I mean, what would they know about sewing? <laughs> what kind of leaves did they find? I mean, you know, I... Well, there's lots of leaves. Yeah. After sin entered our world, things went from bad to worse. It was so bad that Genesis 6 verse 5 in the New King James Version tells us that every intent of the thoughts of his, that is man's heart, was only evil continually. One might think that drowning all but eight in a flood would be a sufficient warning and a sufficient lesson so that those who were descendants of Noah would think they needed to obey God in every detail of their lives. Just the opposite was true. So we read in Genesis 11, 1 to 9 from my Good News Bible, at first, the people of the whole world had only one language and used the same words. As they wandered about in the east, they came to a plain in Babylonia and settled there. They said to one another, come on, let's make bricks and bake them hard. <clears throat> so they had bricks to build. 
with and tar to hold them together. They said, now let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. So God said, I'm going to scatter you. And they said, we don't want to be scattered. And all of this is happening after the flood. This is all after the flood now. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which those men had built. And he said, now then, these are all one people and they speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they're going to do. Soon they will be able to do anything they want. Notice with emphasis on what they want. Let us go down and mix up their language so that they will not understand one another. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. The city was called Babylon because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people and from there he scattered them all over the earth. Good news Bible. When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as a dwelling place. This is Ellen White's words, as a dwelling place for the builders. Uh, other apartments, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to their idols. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold, and set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. Patriarchs and Prophets, 119, paragraph 2. As a result, God found it necessary to confuse the languages so that people would be scattered across the face of the earth. God had to start all over again with his friend Abraham. I'm sorry, at that time he was still Abram, wasn't he? Jim? So before hmm. that, God confused the languages so that what? So they wouldn't communicate effectively with each other? That's what it sounds and like. They wouldn't um, they couldn't continue keep advancing? They, could, they couldn't keep building together because they couldn't talk to each other. Yeah. Slow things down. Yeah. There's a te that text in uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and it is exceedingly corrupt. Who, yeah. can, who can know it? Yeah. You know, it's, it just seems to me no, no bounds. You want to read us Genesis 12? Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country and your relatives and your father's home go to, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. Okay. Good News Bible once again. I will bless all the nations. So how wide is God's influence supposed to go? Doesn't seem to have any boundary, does it? The entire world. Even in those very first words when talking to Abram or Abraham, it is clear that God intended um, for his blessings and his words to be spread to the entire world, to all the nations. Clearly that did not happen. But after Jesus came and lived and died on this earth, Paul, picking up the torch, wrote Galatians 3, 7 and 9. Carrie? You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Through you, God will bless the whole human race. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who believe are blessed as he was. So, after working with Abraham's descendants for about 1,800 years, he sent his son, this is God talking about now, to try to convince those Bible-believing, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping Adventists, I mean, they were very much looking forward to the coming of the Messiah Christ, so that's the definition of an Adventist, to truly love him and obey him, unfortunately, he was not successful in that attempt. But as a result of his coming, living and dying, and rising to life again, the Christian church was started. Many things have happened since Christianity began. Think about the hundreds of years of persecution and then the corruption that came into the church by the mingling of pagan rituals and feast days with the true teachings of God's Son. It was necessary for God to call for a partial reformation in the 16th century. Martin Luther and others led out in that great reform which we call the Reformation. 
So today, don't we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that God has chosen us to take up the torch to carry the gospel to the world? Isn't that our job? But God went beyond just what he did with Abraham and later in the days of Moses. He called the children of Israel out of Egypt and had an encounter with them. An epiphany, that's the technical name for an encounter of God with people, an epiphany at Mount Sinai. Was God fair to the Egyptians and the Canaanites? And here's where we start running into challenges. Did all of those firstborn in Egypt who died really deserve to die? And what about the soldiers who drowned at the bottom of the Red Sea? Throughout scripture, there are many other questions like this that are a challenge to answer. Why did God do this? Why did he do that? Why did God place the children of Israel in Palestine at the crossroads of three continents? What did he want them to do? Well, in Exodus 19, four to eight, you saw what I, the Lord, did to the is Egyptians and how I carried you as an eagle carries her young under her wings and brought you here to me. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, the people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Wow. Okay, that's the beginning of craziness. He's re he, twice more, when we get to chapter 24, they promised all that the Lord has said we will do. Oh, we know how long that lasted, don't we? Well, then you get to jo Joshua chapter one, and they said, well, just, just let's, we obeyed it. Moses and everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll obey you. Um, but if anybody steps out of line, kill them. Yeah, kill them. That, uh, that was based upon their concept of how God operated. However, as we study the history of the Israelites, we see that they were constantly focused on the privileges that were to be theirs if they were obedient, while ignoring the responsibilities and the necessity of the obedience. Why was that such a problem for them? Uh, it couldn't be a problem for us, could it? Of course not. It is hard for us to imagine how the children of Israel, under the guidance of Aaron, could come together, produce a golden bull calf, which they named Yahweh, and engage in a fertility cult worship ceremony while the pillar of cloud representing God's actual presence was a few hundred feet above them on the mount. I mean, every time I read that or think about it, it just blows me away. And as a Go description ahead. of that, Exodus 32, one through six from Good News Bible, when the people saw that Moses had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time, they gathered round Aaron and said to him, we do not know what has happened to this man Moses who led us out of Egypt. So make us a God to lead us. Okay, Gordon, I'm gonna interrupt for a second. Did God intentionally keep Moses up there for a long period of time to see what would happen? Be careful. But was that the primary purpose or was the <laughs> primary purpose to communicate with Israel through Boy. Moses? Was it a test? Good question. Was the, well, was, for the was children the, of Israel or for Aaron? Both. <laughs> Yeah. Was was the tree in the in the garden a, a test, yep. or was it a protection? Yeah. Okay. Continuing with verse two of Exodus thirty-two, Aaron said to them, "Take off the gold earrings which your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. Don't take guess, off your own earrings." Guess guess where the gold earrings came from? Yeah. Those are from the Egyptians. Yeah. yeah. From their. Um, Masters, Masters and so forth. So all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took the earrings, melted them, poured the gold into a mold, and made a gold bull calf. The people said, Israel, this is our God, that is Elohim, who led us out of Egypt. 
Then Aaron built an altar in front of the gold bull calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to honor the Lord, Yahweh the Lord. Wow. Early the next morning they brought some animals to burn as sacrifices and others to eat as fellowship offerings. The people sat down to a feast which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. Wow. And that's what you call worship, right? And all of this was a few days after God appeared on Mount Sinai shook, shook. with thunder, lightning, and people said, everything that the Lord has said, we will do. That's right. Just a but few days I, before this. I have to give them a little bit of leeway, even though they've had plenty of time to learn. Aaron was their leader. Mm -hmm. Why would he go and make a golden calf? I, I, I mean, who, who, who among them even knew how to do that? Someone. Someone must have. God's chosen people failed to remain obedient, right up front. Despite that incredible experience at the foot of Mount Sinai and the relationship that God tried to establish with them over the next year while they were building the sanctuary, they, they were camped at the foot of that mountain a full year. Some very sad events happened when the time came for them to move to the land of Canaan and enter Palestine. Once again, God's chosen people failed to remain obedient. When the spies returned from Palestine, we'll, read, we'll talk more about this later, but they brought with them some amazing things like a bunch of grapes that was so heavy that it had to be carried on a stick between two men. And I always have to smile when I visit Israel. I've had the privilege of visiting Israel two, three times. The symbol for the tourist industry in Israel is some two men carrying a bunch of grapes. <laughs> yeah. But 10 of those spies brought a very evil report. Despite the efforts of Caleb and Joshua to convince the people to trust God and move forward, the children of Israel rebelled. Then they tried to choose another leader and go up, to, up into the land without God's guidance. They, they suffered a disastrous defeat. Try to imagine how Caleb, Joshua, Moses, and Aaron felt when they saw all this evil taking place. Then God declared that awful verdict they must return into the wilderness and wander for 40 years. Mm. So we have the story in Numbers 14, 28 to 35. Now give them this answer. I swear that as surely as I live, I will do to you just what you have asked. I, the Lord, have spoken. Remember, they had, they had said, well, we, if we can't go up, then we're just going to die in this wilderness, or we need to go back to Egypt. And God says, okay, if you want to die in the wilderness, that'll be fine. You will die, and your corpses will be scattered across this wilderness. And uh, this is a question that we need to think about. Um, the skeptics will say, you can't believe this story, because if you had a million people die out there in the desert, even if it was you know, 3,000 years ago, there should be some bones, and nobody's found any bones yet. So what's the answer? Well, part of the answer- Looking in the wrong place? Part of the answer is they're looking in the wrong place, yes. Because you have complained against me, none of you over 20 years of age will enter that land. I promise to let you live there, but none of you will except Caleb and Joshua. You said that your children will be captured, but I will bring them into the land that you rejected, and it will be their home. You will die here in this wilderness. Your children will wander in the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness, until the last one of you dies. I wonder how long that would take. 40 years, apparently. He predicted it exactly, didn't he? You will suffer the consequences of your sin for 40 years, one year for each day, for each of the 40 days you spent exploring the land, and we use that as a key text for the idea that a day for years, God's way of explaining things in prophecy. You will know what it means to have me against you. I swear that I will do this to, your, to you wicked people who have gathered together against me. Here in the wilderness, every one of you will die. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wow. The decree that Israel was not to enter Canaan for 40 years 
was a bitter disappointment to Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua. These are words from Ellen White. Yet without a murmur, they accepted the divine decision, but those who had been complaining of God's dealings with them and declaring that they would return to Egypt wept and mourned greatly when the blessings which they had despised were taken from them. They had complained at nothing, and now God gave them cause to weep. Had they mourned for their sin when it was faithfully laid before them, this sentence would not have been pronounced. But they mourned for the judgment. Their sorrow was not repentance and could not secure a reversing of their sentence. Patriarchs of Prophets, 392, paragraph 1. And of course, that was written by Ellen White. So that's suggesting that, or even saying straight out, if Israel at that time had repented, then God would have said, well, that was a conditional prophecy mm -hmm. and I'll let you go into the land anyway. I will guide you in. Yeah. Yep. But they were not, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't sorry about their sin. They were just sorry about the results. The consequences are yep. painful. It is, is it clear to you why free will is necessary in order for God to grant the ability to love? That's God's character. That's the way he is. He doesn't do a part-time. You know, we have a handout that we've studied sometimes and talked about in this class, talking about exactly the details why we know that without free will, without the ability to choose, you can't have love. You have to have, I mean, if God just says, everybody has to love me, and we're programmed to love, it doesn't mean anything. It's like a tape recorder. You push the button, say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then you run it back, you push the button again, it says, I love you, I love you. Oh, isn't that wonderful? You know, it's, it's just, you think about it, it's ridiculous. And that so, handout is on theox.org, mm -hmm. theox.org, and under the Teacher's Guides, general handouts, general yes. information. The, the, the handout on love. And you there you will see set out exactly de step by step why it's, it was absolutely necessary in order for God to have love. Remember, we started out by saying that God is love. In order to have love in response, he had to allow us to be free. And that was the risk. Yeah. It's been said that you can have freedom without love, but you can't have love without freedom. Yeah, that's a good way to think. I mean, a good, good, good thing to well, think I about. I make it up. So yeah, think about while you, while you're thinking about that issue. Uh, and I've asked or been asked over the years if we recognize that, the, oh, that God has an awful lot of power and He created and He creates all these orbs in the in the universe and so forth. Why did sin begin? Mm -hmm. A simple three-word answer as to why sin arose. God is love. Mm -hmm. Without the freedom to make choice, you don't yep. have love. Would we really be willing to give up our freedom and our ability to love? Think about that. And love is a principle. It's mm -hmm. not a warm, fuzzy feeling no. that you get uh, uh, a, a fleeting moment. No, it's a principle. You have to have the freedom to make bad decisions. Yeah. Well, that's why the Greeks have four different words for love, and we just have one, and it gets a little confusing. So we're talking about here the love which you've heard, probably heard the, the Greek word used, agape love. That's the kind of love we're talking about here, which by principle treats others the way they would want to be treated, whether it's convenient or not. Some people have actually said, in looking at this story, they would be willing to give up their freedom if they could receive a guaranteed place in heaven. Would you do that? They don't have, there's a lot of misunderstanding there to have that limited understanding of uh, God. Obedience is such a limited or central concept in the Bible. What are all the implications of obedience? Where is the boundary between obedience and legalism? Thought about that? And the word that comes across as obedience really means a willingness to listen, take yeah. instruction. Well, you, 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 you mentioned that. It's because the, the word in, in Greek is hupakoe, which means a humble willingness to listen. 
the, the literal word. So think about obedience. There's actually two steps to obedience. Two, if, in order for a, some, someone to obey, they first of all have to listen and understand someone, the, the person's instruction that's asking them to obey. If they, don't, if they don't understand it or they don't listen, then of course nothing happens. Then the second step is they have to make a decision, okay, I'm gonna go do that. Now, God, when he's talking about obedience, is focusing on the listening and understanding. He realizes that as human beings living in a sinful world, we may not even be able, think about the thief on the cross. He wasn't able to go out and live all the things that he believed where he should have done or that God might have wanted him to do. But he said, I believe it. And that's, and God says, okay, I accept that. So it's the listening and understanding that God considers as being the primary thing that's involved in obedience. Our efforts are important. We should try to do it. And if we have the ability to do it, we should. But we don't absolutely have to do it. If we hear and we understand and we want to do it, even if we can't do it, God counts that as obedience. And that's, that's an important thing, I think, to understand. That, that story with the thief on the cross and then, you, then the uh, prodigal son, mm -hmm. two, two magnificent stories that uh, it doesn't take a lot of words to explain. And, uh, and talking about legalism, if we begin to think that we could somehow earn our way to heaven by doing good things, that is legalism. And there's, of course, many other aspects that we could probably talk about, but that's a very simple way of sort of looking at it. We understand the fact that the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They had conquered nations, and they had already, I mean, what, what was the first nation that they beat in war? Egypt. Oh, well, God they, them. they didn't really fight Egypt. God did that for them, got him out of Egypt. Well, God did all of the fighting for yeah. them. Yeah. Well, not all. They tried to do some themselves, and that was a disaster. Oh. But they had, what, do you remember what the name of the first nation that they fought against? Wasn't it Sihon and Og? No. Oh, that was, that was a little bit later. That was 40 years later. Oh. The first nation they fought against were the Amalekites. Oh, gosh, that's the one. Remember, and that was the time when they had to hold Moses' arms up because when his arms were up, they won. As soon as his arms went down, they stopped. To prove what? Who's, who's doing the winning? <laughs> it's obviously God that's doing the winning, isn't it? So they had conquered nations, and they had already captured a portion of, of the land uh, east of the Jordan River, and now comes your Sion and Og. Then they traveled south and camped on the plains of Moab, across from the city of Jericho. While there, preparing to cross the flooded Jordan River, Moses was writing his last words to give them final instructions. And as we mentioned earlier, they were dancing drunk and naked around a fertility cult, uh, some kind of god. Then he climbed Mount Nebo and died. Many of our Christian friends who consider themselves to be scholars believe that the book of Deuteronomy was written hundreds of years after Moses was dead. And you say, what? What do you mean a hundred years after Moses was dead? Well, these people who don't believe it's possible for God to predict the future, say they look at the book of Deuteronomy, if you look at it carefully, the future events that are gonna to happen to Israel if they disobey are spelled out in so much detail that they say, oh, that couldn't have been written by Moses. It had to be written by somebody a long time later after those things happened. So he's writing history, he's not writing prophecy. So these critics do not believe that even God can predict the future. So Deuteronomy is one of the proofs. And so what evidence do we have that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy? Well, the details of Israel's future experiences that appear in the book of Deuteronomy are so clear and precise that these critics believe that the book of Deuteronomy could not have been written in the days of Moses. They believe that, that it was written much later in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and Moses was writing between 1445 and 1440. That's about the time of the Exodus. When did Ezra and Nehemiah exist? All you historians? 500 and something BC? No, after that. 
538, wasn't it? No. That's when they went back. Right the As of Nehemiah, remember, 457 was that okay. famous prophecy. Okay. So they lived from sometime after 500 down to about probably 425 or 405, somewhere there. So almost exactly a thousand years after Moses is when they were active. So um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that Moses was the author. And if we had time just to go back, we could show, I, I will mention just a couple of things here, but there's lots of evidence to suggest that Moses was the one who wrote the book. So who should be involved in studying and understanding the book of Deuteronomy? Who's supposed to study it and learn about it? Was it a book written only for the Jewish people? Some people would like to suggest that. Are any Gentiles addressed in the book? What do you think? From what you think those, those wheels are going around? Well, in the book of Deuteronomy, we find God addressing the Israelites as a group on a number of occasions. So that's an interesting idea. We Christians in our day have come to believe that salvation is an individual matter and that there we're, we're not saved in groups. We cannot be saved by the good deeds or the righteousness of our parents or grandparents or any other group. One of the first and most important questions to be raised in the book of Deuteronomy is, why did God find it necessary to repeat his laws given from Mount Sinai? And remember that those things are repeated almost verbatim. We'll talk about the differences sometime later in Deuteronomy 5. Unfortunately, the children of Israel had been very unfaithful to God during those 40 years in the wilderness. Now the adult population, all those over 20 years of age, at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai were dead, except who? Who's Caleb not dead yet? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, and still Moses and Aaron, as far as we know. God realized that it was a wise idea to repeat those instructions to the new generation. Now I could ask the question, why, you asked why did God repeat the, the Ten, Command, Ten Commandments mm -hmm. from Sinai? Well, and he's opening his, himself up to criticism by saying, this is what was written on the, sto on the tablets of stone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and yet there's differences. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem. It is. It raises, it, it raises questions. It raises questions, but it need not raise questions. We, we need to understand what God is going to try to do, and we'll talk about that when we get to talk about that part of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5. Yeah. Well, there are, we've already suggested that there are four, kind of like four speeches in the book of Deuteronomy. The first one starts with Deuteronomy 1, verse 1, and talks about a lot of the early history. The next speech begins with Deuteronomy 4:44, the third with Deuteronomy 29, verse 1, and the final, a kind of appendix, begins with Deuteronomy 31:1. Each of these sections begins with the same Hebrew words, these are the words, okay? One of the reasons, so it's pretty clear that these are, these are speeches, anyway. One of the readers, one of the reasons why we believe that Moses was the author of Deuteronomy is that a careful study of ancient Egyptian and especially Hittite covenants or treaties show that they follow a definite pattern. In other words, there's a certain way you make a legal document. Back in the days of Moses, we have a few of those recorded in cuneiform and in hieroglyphics. Um, so, see who we comes next. I guess, Carrie, I think it's you. A more careful analysis of the structure of the book of Deuteronomy in the light of ancient Near Eastern literature has revealed a sophisticated organization that follows the pattern of ancient covenant treaties between the suzerain and his vassal, in brackets Egyptian and especially Hittite from the second millennium BC. Okay, let's think about that for a moment where we know that they just came out of the land of Egypt. What do we know about the Hittites? They had been 
ruled part of Egypt, or re Egypt for some time prior to that. They came from the central part of what we now call Turkey, and they had spread east and down across through Palestine. Can you think of a famous Hittite that we read about in the Bible? Uriah. Uriah, Uriah the Hittite, who was the first husband of Bathsheba, who later became David's favorite wife. So they, they, they spread out down through that territory, even down as far as Egypt. And so this was, I mean, God says, well, if we're going to have a contract, let's, let's use the, the sort of format that you're accustomed to. You know, if a legal, I mean, today, if we want to put, up, put together a legal contract, well, who do we go to? We go to a lawyer. We say, okay, how do you do this? And he has his language and everything. So what was the... What was the format here? Carrie, go ahead. From this, uh, hang on, we went, Egyptian, especially he died from the second millennium, which displayed the following features. Preamble, Deuteronomy chapter one, verses one through five. Historical prologue, Deuteronomy one, six through 449. Stipulations, general, Deuteronomy 5 to 11, specific Deuteronomy 12 to 26, blessings and curses, Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 28. Let me interrupt again for a second. What would, why would there be blessings and curses? We're here, we're, we're putting together a covenant agreement between two groups of people. Why would there be blessings and curses? It's a good question. Okay, well. Well, this, if you comply, this is a yeah, blessing. Exactly. You if, you, if you don't, this is a consequence. Yeah, exactly. If you obey, da-da-da-da-da. If you disobey, da-da-da-da. I mean, isn't that, we know about those kind of things even in our day, don't Sometimes we? Sometimes it's, it's a, a promise of reward or a threat of punishment. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and then the last one. Covenant, Loyalty, and Witnesses, Deuteronomy 29, Deuteronomy 30. That's from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Study Guide. Okay. God worked very closely with the children of Israel. The history as recorded in Deuteronomy and in the other books of Moses does not follow a very strict cause and effect chronological order. We are so such creatures of time. We have to have watches and we have to have cell phones and we have, okay, which minute are we supposed to meet? And how long is the meeting supposed to be? And we're, we are such creatures of time that we look back and we want everything in the past to be you know, laid out in exact order. Yeah, bang, bang, bang. And this, this thing happens after that. So therefore, this can affect this and so forth. That's the way we think. They didn't think like that. They had other ideas. And, and they had no way. They had no watches, no clocks, no nothing like that. They want to know what time of the day it was. Oh, the sun's about over there. Okay, I know about what time it is. And you, I remember reading when I was a child about a, a, an old hermit that lived up in the mountains, and people went to see him and just wondered how he lived and what, what his life was like. And one of the questions they wanted was, well, living up here by yourself, how do you know what time it is? And they asked him two or three different times. He just looked up, it's about 4.20. 4.20, and a little while later, looked up, oh, it's about 5.15. 5.15, he, he was plus, plus or minus a minute or two, just look up in the sky. So, instead we find that God initiates something, perhaps a covenant or an idea, by his actions, which is followed by behaviors from the people as a result of that covenant. God acts and the people react. The Bible is implying that all real history is what? His story. It is important for us to recognize a couple of very significant aspects of the book of Deuteronomy. Myra? Although this lesson dips over into Isaiah and Ezekiel to point out that the great controversy was fully underway in the days of Moses, Deuteronomy itself does not mention the devil. The great controversy, great controversy did not seem to be a part of the thinking of Moses when writing Deuteronomy. Number two. God's government, governmental covenant is expressed through his love to the people. That's shown in Deuteronomy 4, 37, 7, verse, chapter 7, verse 8, and 
chapter 10, verse 15, and 23, verse 5, etc. The book also focuses a lot on what God expects back from them in the form of love. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, chapter 7, verse 9, and chapter 10, verse 12. So clearly these things are well documented in the book of Deuteronomy, aren't they? The love of God is talking, the love God is talking about in Deuteronomy is a principled form of love. We talked about this earlier, in which God puts himself on the line in order to assist his people. It is not a superficially emotional, sentimental kind of love. Notice these words. Um, God's love is in, I'm sorry, Gordon, you can do that for me. God's love, from the yeah. Teacher's Bible Study Guide, God's love is intense and infinite and is manifested through events that express the intensity, the authenticity, and the infinite nature of his love. Because of this love, which created the heavens and the earth, and their references, also, God also entered the arena of human events and saved his people. A couple of references from Deuteronomy. In response to the divine love, Israel, the people of the covenant, are urged by God, quote, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love implies then that they should remember God, hear him, strive to understand and obey his words, fear him and serve him. And there are references for each of those. Yes, and if you have our handout, which you can get at our website at uh, www.theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can download this or you can look in your, if you have the teacher's edition of the Bible study guide, you can find it there. But there's multiple references to support each one of these ideas. It, there's a lot of this material in the book of Deuteronomy. So the book of Deuteronomy includes the final words from Moses to his people just before they enter the land of Canaan. We as Christians believe that these words were given to Moses by God himself. And we as Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians, as we, we as Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians believe that we're about to enter the heavenly Canaan, shouldn't these same directions and the advice guide us? Hearing and even studying the Word of God is not enough. It must be a part of our lives and actions. When I was a child, Jacques Ducan says, I heard my, from my rabbi an oral legend about a man who found a miraculous tump, t trumpet in the market. And I'm gonna have to drop down here a little bit so we don't run out of time. But the ma magic trumpet wasn't to sort of make the fire go out. The magic trumpet was to call everyone, help them come and, burn, and put the fire out. But it was misunderstood and the man burned his house down. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we begin the study of this book of Deuteronomy, may we represent you correctly. May we understand the principles and guidance that you intended to give to your people. May we understand especially what it tells us about you as we study along as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.